down off that. Well, good morning. I'm good to get it back. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. We are here to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ for all that he's done for us. Amen. Amen. And I'm glad to see all of you guys here to learn another chapter of the Word of God. We're back in Hebrews. We're in chapter 11. I really thought we were going to finish by the end of the year. But I'm not sure we will. So uh, if you hold tight, hopefully we'll get through the many verses of chapter 11. But let's just pray. Father, we, we come before you and we thank you for your grace. We thank you for seeing our broken, sinful condition and that at the right time that you sent your son to be an example, to be our savior, to be the one who showed us how to live life, that taught us about the heart of the father. I thank you, Lord, that you also came and offered yourself as an offering for us, that we might be made right with you and might be reconciled, not because of anything that we do other than receiving the free gift of your forgiveness. So Lord, this morning we gather as your people, as those that you've called, and uh, I'm sure many of us are hungry to, to know you better, that you would fill up our spiritual cup, that you would help us to be closer to you, help us to be more knowledgeable of you, And Lord, that you might increase our faith. I pray that you help us as we look at your word that we might learn of you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Previously at Grace, I try to do the TV show thing. It doesn't work. We've been looking at the book of Hebrews, which basically is that Jesus is greater. He's greater than all of the things in the Old Testament because they're all shadows, they're all pictures, they're all metaphors, they're all types of who Jesus ultimately came to be. So last week we talked about how Jesus was a better sacrifice and gave us superior service. We looked at one of the more difficult passages in the scripture about sinning willfully after acknowledging the truth and what that all meant within that culture. And uh, if you don't know what that means and you're scared, good. You can look back from next week. This week, we're going to get into chapter 11. Those of you who have read through it know it as the Hall of Faith. How many of you have read through chapter 11? Okay, you're excused. You can go. This is the Hall of Faith. It's going to go over all of these folks that have gone on before us. The scripture calls them the elders, those who are uh, our predecessors. And looking at their examples of faith, And just to show that it wasn't by works, it wasn't because they were fabulous people or they were stellar in and of themselves, but by faith, they inherited the promises, as the scripture says. Verse 1 says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Uh, It's a bit of a complicated passage, but we're going to open it up and take a look at it. So something that faith is, usually people think faith is something you have to be a little bit like a cheerleader and and pump yourself up into, right? Like, I believe I can do it. I can do it like the little engine that could, you know? I know I can't. I, I think I can. I think I, oh, I can't. I can't. Oh, but maybe I can. Oh, oh, I'm getting closer. Okay. Oh, I can do this. Now, that's mostly what people think faith is about. It's about pumping yourself up emotionally to believe something that's unbelievable. The scripture has a different definition. It says faith is substance. It's evidence. It's tangible. It's not just ethereal. It's not an idea and a concept. It's not something that you pump yourself up into. Faith is assurance. And it's evidence. And it's substance. And it says, for by it, the elders obtained a good testimony. Faith in its simplest form, if you want the simplest explanation, because I'm a simple man, it's believing what God says is true. It's believing what God says is true. Now, you may believe me, you may not believe me, doesn't matter. Has absolutely no eternal consequence for you. But if you don't believe God, that has eternal consequences. If you believe God, it has eternal consequences. 
And so it has nothing to do with whether you believe me or not, or you believe anyone else on the face of the planet, but it's believing God within the context of this passage. So faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things that are not seen. So the scripture is talking about things in the future, those things that are hoped for, and things that are not seen, the invisible. It's about seeing the invisible. Believing the impossible. That's what faith is. And it's a faith that's not without understanding. Faith that takes a giant leap, but it doesn't take a giant leap into the unknown. It takes a giant leap into that which we already understand, and it's believing what God has said is true. Make sense? Good. Because that's the platform that we're going to take a giant dive into history. So we need to understand that. In Romans chapter 10, 17, it says, so then faith comes by and hearing by the word of God. It's interesting, it doesn't say faith comes by reading. And it doesn't say faith comes by seeing. It says faith comes by hearing. Isn't that interesting? Whenever Jesus told a parable and he wanted people to listen up, he said, he who has an ear, let him hear. Isn't it interesting that God uses the auditory instead of the visual. In fact, if you understand what the lust of the flesh is, the first thing it is, is the lust of the eyes. It seems like the eye gate is through which much temptation comes. And yet faith comes by hearing. You guys are so responsive. I love that. I feel like I'm not alone. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. It says that when God created the worlds into existence, he spoke them. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. So all of, these, all of these things in the scripture, you start to kind of put them together like pearls on a string, and you're like, aha. By the way, this faith that we're called into, this believing God for what he says is true, is sometimes a very difficult thing to jump into. By the way, that word, word, I love saying things that confuse people, but that word, word, right there is actually rhema, which is the spoken word of God, that which is an utterance. That's actually the definition of it. If you look in through the Johnine, uh, like the book of John, John uses the word word and it's logos, which is a different word. This is rhema, that which is done by speech, that which is spoken by utterance. Just so you understand, there's two different uh, things for the word word and uh, you can make much of that. Here's an expanded version, in other words. Now, faith is the assurance, the title deed or confirmation of things hoped for, divinely guaranteed, and the evidence of things not seen, the conviction of their reality. Faith comprehends as fact that, that uh, what cannot be experienced by the physical senses. Now, that if you were looking for a longer explanation, there it is for you collegiate types. You can pull that apart. Faith enables the believing soul to treat the future as the present and the invisible as seen. That's Oswald Chambers. Whenever I need backup, I'll put somebody's name on the bottom of a quote. Then you're like, oh, oh, that's not Pastor Dave's idea. It's Oswald Chambers. So uh, I do that periodically when I feel like I need to have some authority. But that's what faith is. Now, it's essential for salvation, by the way, to believe God and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him is essential for salvation. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, Amen. not of works, lest anyone should boast. So that when we go, when we stand before the presence of God and he's going to assign us an eternal home, and he says, well, why should I let you into heaven? If you, bring, if you go looking in your pocket for something that you bring, you will be sadly disappointed because it's not of works. It's not anything that we manufacture or able to do. God can do, God can get anything. What can we bring to him that is going to benefit him? Or he'll say, oh, wow, thank you so much. God can make anything. He can do anything. What in the world can we bring? We can bring faith. 
faith, but it's not going to be manufactured. It's not going to be, okay, it's Sunday morning, Dave, get your act together here. It's not going to be like that. It's going to be, God, you got to help me here. And I believe what your promises say, and then you have to know what they are, right? You can't just take a step out onto nothing. You can't have faith in faith. But I believe, I believe, I believe. It doesn't matter. Do you believe the truth? Because there are a lot of people who believe, but they don't believe the truth. True saving faith is based upon God's grace. And without that, we're not saved. We're not his people. We're not his kids. So faith, we're introduced to as a definition. In Hebrews 6, 11 to 12, which we went through once, and we desire that each one of you show the same diligence, a full assurance of the hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So it's the desire of God and of the author of Hebrews that we imitate those. Do you know what, you know what it is to imitate someone? Yeah, uh, it's rather annoying somebody when, when somebody's trying to imitate you, right? And they, like a little kid, it just repeats back to you what you said. Repeat back to you what you said. Yeah, repeat back to me what, repeat back to you what you said. Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? You know, it's just, it can go on forever, right? But it's not like that. It's to look to those, like Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. It's about seeing God in somebody else and seeing these attributes that God has put there and say, you know, I need that. I need to be more like you in this respect and that respect because it's more like Christ. Amen. So we imitate those who have gone on before us who have been examples of faith. And then it talks about this as we go on. This ancient battle of faith, which most people struggle with, it's an ancient battle and it's won in the same way as it's always been won because it's an invisible force, right? And yet there's substance and evidence to it. What the scripture teaches us is we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities. These are thoughts and ideas against powers, influences, sometimes emotional, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, which means bad propaganda and bad media, against spiritual hosts of wickedness, which means there is a source in, in satanic worship in the heavenly places. They are up in authoritative places where they make decisions for what's going on in this world. The devil's allowed to run around here for a little while, but it's not gonna be forever. Amen. And the way to overcome him is by faith. It's by believing what God says, as opposed to what you feel, or what you see, or what you're told. How many of you have ever been told that you're a worthless piece of garbage and you'll never amount to anything? That's a lie. By the way, where does it come from? The hosts of wickedness. That's a bunch of baloney. What does God say? God said he loved you so much he sent his only son and sacrificed him for you. So what do you believe? Some of us are back and forth. To be honest, some of us are back and forth. Faith means I believe what God said over what I feel, what I've heard, and what I see. Amen? Amen. All right, we'll see some good examples of that. It says, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen are not made of the things which are visible. You know, scientists will tell you that everything existed, all matter existed in an infinitesimal spot. <laughs> and one day, for no reason whatsoever, it just exploded into everything we have. Scripture says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's what it says. Which is, which is harder to believe? <laughs> I don't have enough faith to believe there was an infinitesimal spot, but I do have enough faith to believe that there was nothing and God created everything. I can believe that because that doesn't cross any lines of science whatsoever. And yet an infinitesimal spot where all gravity, all matter, all weight, all volume, everything was there and then turned into everything, sounds like Genesis 1-1 to me. 
In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Uh, the, the, the old King James says brooding uh, like a hen would over, over eggs, you know, waiting for a creative act to occur. So this is the Spirit of God that caused this action to happen. And it says the earth, the whole earth was covered with water. Do we see that evidenced in the earth? Sure we do. We got two polar ice caps that we're so concerned about melting because if they do, what happens? We're underwater. Yeah, that's what happens. So what did God do with the water afterwards? I have a feeling he pulled it to the poles. But, you know, this isn't science. <laughs> but I believe that God created everything. God created everything and that by faith. And yet there's evidence, isn't there? And there's substance to back that up. And it's reasonable. It's not a blind faith. It's a reasonable faith. In 2 Corinthians 4.18, it says, So we fix our eyes on what, it, on what is seen, on not what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, and what is unseen is eternal. So the scripture teaches us to keep our eyes on looking beyond the face of what you see, right? You know, you know what it is to look beyond the face of a person that you're talking to? You know, you have a conversation and, you know, the second before they, your eyes meet, they're like this. And then they see you and they go, oh, hi. Hi, how are you? <laughs> and you can see beyond that that there's something else going on in the subroutine in the back of their mind. Right? You can look beyond. And the scripture tells us we should look beyond that which is seen to that which is unseen. Because those things are eternal. Things that are seen are temporal. By faith, our first example, by faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts, and through it, he being dead still speaks. It's an interesting passage about Abel. If you remember the story in Genesis 4, two brothers, brothers, they were brothers, <laughs> You got Cain, who's the older, and you've got Abel. Abel brings a sacrifice before God, which tells me he knew he was a sinner. Why else would you bring a sacrifice? He knew he was a sinner, and he knew the prescribed fashion in which it was to be done with blood. An innocent animal would have to die for the sacrifice. And you think, well, how did he know that? Moses didn't write the law yet. The whole Levitical system wasn't there yet. How did he know? Well, if you back up to Adam and Eve when they fell... There were some innocent animals that had to be sacrificed to cover Adam and Eve after their sin. And so there was an innocent animal or animals that had to die to cover their nakedness. And God was the one who did it. So that's a great example if God does it, right? And so God does that to cover Adam and Eve when they sin and kicks them out of the garden. So there's circumstance and there are all sorts of curses that come because we decided to step out. Abel is obedient to do the right thing in the right way, the way God said. And by faith, he said, okay, I don't know why God wants me to do this, but I'm going to do it. And he does it. That's commendable. He's got an older brother who happens to work the field. And he says, well, I'm going to bring what I've worked for. I'm going to put it out here and say, God, here's the stuff. And the Lord said, that's not what I want. And you know it. And so what he does is he gets jealous of Abel. He looks over at Abel and he sees that God is approving of his sacrifice. How did he know that God approved of his sacrifice? Well, you could talk about that later. It's rather interesting and there's, there are all kinds of commentators that have pulled all sorts of great ideas. But bottom line, Abel was approved by God and Cain got jealous and he killed his brother. You ever had somebody jealous of you? Just a few of you, huh? Okay. I've had people jealous of me because of who I married. I had a guy hit on my wife right in front of me. I was amazing. Anyway. This guy looks over at my wife and he goes, you are so beautiful. You are so exotic. And I was like, that is so funny. I could have slapped the spit out of his mouth, but I didn't. 
And you know what I honestly thought? Good on you, mate. You, you just encouraged my wife. You didn't even know that. You, I, I wanted to tell him, what a great encouragement you are. My wife, thank you so much for that. Because I say it all the time, and it, you know. But a complete stranger, he was leaning in, boy, I'll tell you. It made me smile. And I didn't hurt him. I, not, not that you know of. So, by faith, Abel offered a better sacrifice because it was the right sacrifice in the right way. His heart was right. The sacrifice was right. There was blood that was shed. All of that was in conjunction to what he already knew and what he learned about God. And by faith, he did that which, I mean, to mutilate an animal, my goodness, you know, you'd have the ASPCA on you in a heartbeat. But this guy knew, this is what God wants, this is what I'm going to do, and he did. He ended up losing his life because he obeyed God, and he was faithful. And Cain was angry. I love the way God comes and he whispers to Cain, he says, what's wrong with your face? The Jersey version. Why are you so downcast? If you do right, will you not be lifted up? And yet, if you don't, Satan is crouching at the door and his desire is to have you, but you must master him. God comes to him and speaks to him and says, you know, you better straighten it out or you're going to end up in a really bad place. Talks to him before he did it. Isn't that a loving thing for the Heavenly Father to do? He does the same for us. I go to do something that, uh, you know, I'm not really sure is a good thing. And he's like, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, all right, Lord, you're, you're right, you're right. Shouldn't do that. So we have this great example of Abel, and we have this terrible example of Cain. Cain, not by faith, making a sacrifice, giving the works of his hands, which is what we do when we try to be good enough for God to love us. Giving the works of his hands instead of doing and being obedient by faith. Verse 5, by faith Enoch was taken out of the way so that he did not see death and he was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, well, that's halfway there, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You see, it's not just believing that God exists. Because you know who believes that God exists? The devil. the devil does. And his angels, the fallen ones. So if you have faith that God exists, you have the same faith as the devil does. Not good enough. You must believe that he is and he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Which means we have this compunction, this invitation to seek him. So Enoch, the... You know, you know how old Enoch was when he died? It's pretty good. Somebody had it right at the top of mind over here. Now, it's interesting. Methuselah in the Bible is the oldest living man in the Bible. He lived 969 years. And yet... He was the longest living man, <clears throat> longer than his father. Anyway, I, I won't tell you. Methuselah dies at 969. He lives longer than anyone else. But do you know who lived longer? Enoch. Enoch was his father. And he lived longer because he never died. That's the punchline of my sad joke. So the days of Enoch were 365 years and Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. So it's an interesting thing that the, the word in the King James says translated. If it was in the Latin Vulgate, it would be rapturo, which means he took him. He came and raptured him the heck out of here. You get the idea that they really looked for him. Because it says he couldn't be found. It's like this interesting hide and seek where they couldn't find him and he just was gone. So Enoch goes and it's by faith that God takes him because he, he was a man who said that he pleased God. 
It's always been God's desire to be in a relationship with us. It's always been God's desire to be in relationship with us. And I think the biggest obstacle is us wanting to be independent, do it myself. I don't need your help. I can do everything myself. That's the greatest enemy of intimacy with God is a lack of dependency. Faith pleases God. The testimony about Enoch is that he pleased God because he believed him. That's a, that's a pretty good statement. That's in Genesis 4. By the way, you'll notice that the book of Hebrews is going sequentially through all of these characters, uh, through the timeline. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world to become heir of righteousness, which is in according to faith. Wow. Wow. So Noah was told by God of something that he didn't see, that hadn't come yet. In fact, there's an argument to say that rain had never hit the earth yet. It says early in the, in the uh, dialogue in Genesis that a mist would come up over the night and water everything. Can you imagine explaining to somebody that there's going to be rain that comes from the sky and never having seen rain before? That's an interesting thing. And yet... He believed God and he did something about it. You see, that's what faith is. It's substance. It's evidence. It can be seen. It can be pointed to. It can be identified. It's faith. By faith, Noah builds this gigantic ark. It took a long time to build that thing. And constantly, every day that he did it, it was a message to all of those people. God told me he's going to come and judge all you people. You better straighten out. I'm building an ark. I'm getting out of here. It was over a hundred years worth of ministry in telling them that. And when the door was shut, when God shut the door, there was no more choosing. And there was no more faith because they saw it with their eyes. And God wiped everyone out except those who were in the ark. And God lifted them up and took them. By faith, faith can be seen. It can be pointed to. It can be identified. It's evidence. It's substance. It's not just ethereal. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out of the place in which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. That sounds like much of what we do. <laughs> By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs of him of the same promise. For he waited for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. So Abraham, when he was told to go, went. Have you ever, have you ever had the Lord speak to your heart to do something and you didn't went? Yes. yes. You didn't go. Yep. It's a sad story. And yet it's amazing how God uses all that stuff anyway. He went. Abraham heard and he did. And he says, I need you to come out. It's interesting, the, the writer of Hebrews, and I think the way God looks at this, if you look at God's call on Abraham, he was 75, he was Abram at that time, 75 years old, land of the Chaldees. God says, I want you to leave all of your family, your household, and follow me to a place where I'll show you. He said, okay, but I'm going to take my dad and I'm going to take my nephew. That's not exactly what God told him to do. And so he takes his dad and his nephew and he goes upstream to Haran. His father dies. Then he says, okay, now I'm going to go where the Lord told me. I'm just going to bring this guy Lot. And he brings his nephew. And then he and his nephew have all kinds of conflict to the point where they have to part ways. And finally God got him to the place where he was supposed to be. But it wasn't immediate like that. It was drawn out over years. You guys ever had something that you were obedient to God, but it took years? Yes. Happens all the time. <laughs> Happens all the time with me. I'm still learning. I'm still being, all right, Lord, I got to submit this to you. I'm sorry. It's interesting how that happens. And yet the story doesn't talk about that. Right here in the book of Hebrews where it talks about faith, it says, by faith he left. So will God honor even a little bit of faith? Yeah. 
will he honor a contaminated faith? Oh, I could tell you more stories about how he went to Egypt a couple of times and, you know, picked up an extra wife and had an extra son. And I, I could tell you all sorts, and I'm sure God didn't lead him to do that because the scripture would have told us that. And he ended up going back to do what God told him to do. God will honor whatever you have. I mean, a mustard seed, Jesus said, a mustard seed. It's a very teeny, teeny, weeny little seed. You would see it and think it was dust. And God will honor that because he'll take that little seed and he'll grow it. And so he had to take everything. And I don't know about you, but when you're 75 years old, you've had years and years and years of collecting. And that's a lot of stuff to move. But he did. And he was obedient because faith goes. When God says go, you go. And he obeyed his voice. Faith obeys. It goes. It inherits. And sometimes faith does not know. Because he went to a place that he didn't know. God told him to go to a place he'd show him. I mean, didn't even give him a direction. North, south. Little help here? What did Abraham have to start doing? Stepping. Start, pack it up. Load it up. Start stepping. Isn't that the way our life is? Yes. Lord, how am I doing? Am I doing okay? Am I going in the right direction? Oh, no, okay. All right, I'll, I'll go back this way. Life of faith means that you're constantly looking for those signals. Like, Lord, am I doing the right thing? Am I doing what you want me to do? And that's what Abraham had to do. That's an example of faith. And it says faith dwells in promise. It's with hope that God is going to do what he said he's going to do. And faith waits. Abraham had to wait over 25 years until God fulfilled his promise of him having a son. When he turned 100, I think it was finally time when God said, okay, he knows this ain't going to happen on his own, so I'll do it now. And he's able to have a son at 100 years old. That's got to be tough. Verse 11, by faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed. Yeah, in your 90s, you need to receive some strength. <laughs> and she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Do you see her faith? Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born as many as the stars of the sky in a multitude innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. Because of faith, because they believed God, because Sarah specifically believed God. It's interesting because when you go back to Genesis and you read the story, did she believe God? She laughed. She laughed. I'm going to come back this time and Sarah's going to have a child. <laughs> the Lord says, hey, why'd your wife laugh? I don't know. Why don't we ask her? Hey, Sarah, why'd you laugh? I didn't laugh. <laughs> yes, she <you> did. <laughs> Read the dialogue. It's exactly like that in the Jersey version. And she received strength in, in Genesis 18 to have children. And because of that little faith of a willingness and an openness to say, God, you know, I'm going to just take a wild guess to believe that you're right. And God honored that. And because of that, we have the whole Jewish nation without which they wouldn't exist. And there'd be a lot of trouble. Verse 13, and all these in the past all died in faith. Like Abraham and Sarah were said that they would have as many offspring as the stars in the sky. They died before that happened, right? Not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them and embraced them. You see, that's what faith does. It brings assurance it brings an embracing and confess that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth for those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland and truly if they had recalled to mind the country in which they had come out they would have had opportunity to return in other words if you wanted to go back to where you came from where God called you 
You'd have that opportunity if you were thinking about it, you'd inevitably do that. But now they desire a better that is a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. And he has prepared a city for them. You see the evidence. You see the substance of their faith. And we looking back and see the benefit of their faith. They understood that they were pilgrims here in this world. You know, that's what we are. This isn't our home. We're just, we're just doing what the Lord would have us do now until we get to the final city in heaven. You know, so when somebody asks your address, <laughs> verse 17, by faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. That sounds familiar. Of whom it was said, in Isaac your seed shall be called. Concluding that God was able to raise him up. Even from the dead. From which he also received him in a figurative sense. So God was doing a bit of show and tell with this whole thing. He tells Abraham, you're going to have as many descendants as, you know. And his wife says, well, you know, I'm, pfft, I'm done. So maybe my maidservant can help you out. And Abraham was like, okay. <laughs> and so he has a child, not with his wife. And Ishmael grows up and he grows to love this kid. And guess what happens? God's promise is fulfilled and Sarah's pregnant and has a child. And there's always problem with Isaac and Hagar and Ishmael. And they're butting heads, butting heads. Gee, I wonder why. Jealousy. Sounds like Cain and Abel. They should have read Genesis. <laughs> and the Lord speaks to Abraham. And he says, you need to let this woman go. And her son. And he loved Ishmael. He was like, you're kidding me, God, really? Because it was a work of flesh. It was a work of his own hands. It wasn't the gift of God. So how great was his faith? Not so great. But we see this process of God developing his faith to the point where all he has left is Isaac. And the scripture calls it his one and only son because as far as God was concerned, that is his only son. Which tells me all of the products and the junk that you've produced that are not fruitful and didn't come from him are all going to get burned up. And they won't endure. I'm glad for that. How about you? Yeah. And so then he tells him, take your son, your only son. It's interesting that he words it that way. And I want you to take him to the place where I will show you. And I want you to sacrifice him to me. I gave him to you and I want you to take him and give him back. Imagine having to sacrifice your only son. Any one of your sons. Let's say you got a bunch. Let's say you got daughters. I mean, imagine... And Isaac is in his 30s. He's not a child as you see in Sunday school. And it took him three days. Abraham said, okay, he's dead to me. And so for three days, went and traveled, sacrifices him. And he says, you know, father, here's the wood and here's the fire, but where's the lamb? The Lord will provide himself a lamb. And the Lord does. And he calls it, on the mount of the Lord, he will provide it will be seen. He calls it Mount Moriah. We know it as Mount Calvary, where Jesus was put up one day. He considered him dead for three days, and he says, well, God, I'm going to trust you at your promises that you're going to raise up a, a nation, as many as the stars of the sky, even though you tell me to sacrifice my son. I don't know how you're going to do it, but that's not my problem. And he believed that in the resurrection, notice, that his son would come back to him, that God would be faithful. And that's why Abraham is the father of the faithful. You know, John 3.16 says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Why was it so important that Abraham do this? Because it was a picture of Jesus. It was a picture of God the father who ultimately would have to sacrifice his son for us. That's why Abraham is so important, and that's why it's such a big deal. 
and he believed in the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4 says, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. Do you guys know any Old Testament scriptures, because that's what they're talking about, that talk about Jesus being risen on the third day? We read that and say, sure, the New Testament talks about that everywhere, but when it was written in, the, in Corinthians, that wasn't the case. We didn't have 66 books. What scripture is he talking about? I think he's talking about Abraham. From the time Abraham said, you know, I will do it, to the time he received his son back was three days. And he assumed he was resurrected. And it's interesting, you don't hear about Isaac anymore in the narrative until this unnamed servant goes and gets him a bride and unites them. Very much the picture of Jesus Christ coming for his bride. But anyway, I digress. Verse 20, by faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. You guys know the story, he went through Genesis. Jacob went in and pretended to be his brother and stole fizzy lifting drinks. No, he stole the blessing. He stole the blessing from his dad. His father knew that God intended for the younger to be blessed over the elder. He knew that before they were ever born. Interesting. And yet when they were born, he favored not Isaac. Uh, not Jacob, but Esau. Esau was a man's man. Facial hair, the whole thing. Harley Davidson kind of guy. And he favored him because he cooked him really good stew that he enjoyed. That's a heck of a reason to favor one kid over the other. But, and so Jacob, knowing this, had a plot with his mom and put goat hair on himself and made himself all stinky like outside, like a man who sweated a bunch. He was a man who lived in tents. So he wasn't uh, that intense. Sorry, I was in my head. Forgive me. So... He had to stink himself up and, and go before his father and uh, get this blessing because his dad thought he was dying and he didn't die for many years. But he stole this blessing. And when Esau comes in and, and he makes some, this meal and he provides him with this meal, he says, I'm here for my blessing. He goes, I, I just gave you my blessing. He goes, no, you didn't. Well, who was that was just here? And he begins to shake violently in his bed because God had him do something unbeknownst to him that God wanted done. And he got all freaked out and he said, sorry, my son, I can't bless you. Now I gave it to the other one. And he suddenly comes to compliance with God's will, forcibly. Ever have that happen? going to do what God told me to anyway. It's like, I'm sick, I shouldn't go to work, so I'm going to go to work anyway. And then you're going to start your car and it doesn't start. Guess what? You're not going to work anyway. Because God's in control of everything. So, these things happen. But it says, by faith, Isaac blessed Jacob. Isn't that interesting? How God sees things differently than us. When Esau came back, he had a real problem. He had a real problem. And then Esau said, I'm going to kill my brother. Well, that, that's happened before. Way back with Cain and Abel. So he got out of Dodge. Verse 21. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of his sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning on the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the departure of the children of Israel and gave instructions concerning his bones. <laughs> By faith. Now, if you read through the story, I, I don't want to get so bound up, I'm going to lose time here real fast. These guys obey God in some combination of perfection and imperfection. And we get to see how God used them. When it was time for, for Jacob to bless, he adopted Ephraim and Manasseh, and he switches his arms, and you know the whole story, and did what God told him to by faith, that the younger would serve uh, with that the older would serve the younger and be more blessed. And he also gave instructions concerning his bones. You see, he knew that God was going to free the people 
from Egypt, but he didn't know when. And so he said, listen, when you guys leave here, take my bones with you. And he said this while he was still alive, which means he believed God. He believed God beyond his life, that God would do what he said, even though he wouldn't be there to see it. Now that's faith. This reveals Joseph's knowledge that God's promises would not be actualized in his lifetime. You see how faith shows itself in strength when you're weak. And faith makes a home where God lives. He says, take my bones out because I want to go to the promised land. That's where I want to be laid out. I don't want to be in this foreign land with these people, even though most of his life was spent there. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. If you remember, Pharaoh said, any Egyptian male is to be thrown into the Nile. Throw them in and have them assassinated Con out of convenience because this is an unwanted pregnancy. I don't want to see these, these Jews proliferate anymore. And of course, you know the story. They said, this, this child is special. God has convinced me this, this child is valuable and I am not going to do that. And so they threw him in the Nile in a boat with a cover, tried to keep him fed and quiet. So they were obedient, and yet they were more obedient to God because they preserved his life. So there's this interesting combination of obeying the law and doing what God says. I think they, they did the right thing, right? Amram and Jochebed were his parents. They were God-fearing parents who understood that there was a bigger plan than the command of Pharaoh. There's a bigger thing. And God is the one to be obedient to. And yet there's a way that we have to be obedient to the government as well. And so that's the story of how Moses became Moses, which means he was drawn out of the water. That's actually what his name means. And by faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Esteeming the reproach of Christ... Richer, of greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he looked to the reward. Isn't that interesting? He regarded Christ before Christ was even around. That's rather interesting. Hmm. So we see that he was faith, he was full of faith, and he refused to do what Pharaoh told him to do. Now, it took a while for him to get there, right? If you remember, he was a murderer, and he, he's, I'm just going to kill all the Egyptians one at a time. Well, that wasn't God's way, so he got taken out for 40 years until what you and I would call retirement age, which would be 80. He was 80 years old when the Lord called him to the bush, and he said, take off your shoes. You're on holy ground. And he revealed himself. And he said, I want you to go back. And he said, hamana, hamana, hamana. I can't speak. He says, all right, I'll send your brother. He's on his way, by the way. Okay, well, send whoever you want, just don't send me. And besides, I don't even know your name. And God reveals himself as I am. I am. That means I'm, I'm the one who's always been, I am now, and I forever will be. I am. God revealed himself as the, the all-knowing one, the one who's always existed and always will be. He refused because God told him to do something. He suffered reproach with the people of God because of what God told him. And he was willing to suffer for a period of time because he believed God. And then there's also the reward because, you know, they get out of Dodge real quick. Colossians 1.24, Paul writing, he says, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. He's expressing this desire to embrace the sufferings that God's brought into his life for the body of Christ. And he says, I'm, I'm willing to do that. I'm willing to do it all day long. And I'm going to fill up in my body that which Christ wasn't able to do because his ministry was only 33 years. So I'm going to continue running with the torch. That's a great attitude, isn't it? Because that's what Moses did. And by faith, he was willing to suffer with the people of God for a season. And by faith, he forsook Egypt not fearing the wrath of the king, 
for he endured as seeing him who was invisible. He was obedient and he went into the wilderness for 40 years of his life. You want to talk about losing a big chunk of your life. 40 years he went in the desert because God was trying to extract Egypt out of him. I hope it takes less for me and you. Amen. <laughs> he was rejected by his own people and in so doing he becomes a picture of Jesus Christ, doesn't he? Because Jesus came to his own and yet his own did not receive him. But to those who receive him he gives the right to be called children, even children of God. In Philippians 3:12 to 15 it says Paul expressing now that I have not that I have already attained or I am already perfected, but I press on, which is what faith does that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have ap apprehended. In other words, I, I'm not perfect. But one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. By the way, that's what faith does. You got to forget what's behind you, right? So you tear off the rearview mirror, so to speak, of your life. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. I love the grace he says that in. He says, listen, I'm saying something really important, but if you don't get it, ah, the Lord will figure it out for you. He'll show you. He'll reveal it to you. I just love that. So whatever, whatever struggle you're having with that, don't worry about it. The Lord will give you enlightenment. But you see what faith does? It forgets. There are some things we should just forget, right? And reach forward. And by faith he kept the Passover with the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. You see, you have to apply the blood. There's something, evidence. There's substance behind faith, not just words. By faith they passed through the Red Sea, as by dry ground, whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so were drowned. So it says that all of the people who got freed from Egypt went over on faith. And then Pharaoh's men tried to follow. That was called presumption. I think there are going to be a lot of Christians who we're going to meet in heaven and be very surprised that they're there. And I think there'll be other people who are going to be surprised they're not there. Because it's by presumption. You know, you don't, get to heaven, you don't get to heaven because your parents are Christians. You don't, like, get born into that. You have to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Those guys went in under presumption, and they all drowned. So obeying the very details communicated by God is vitally important that we do those things and express our faith. Out of judgment and into security and into safety is where all the Jews went. By faith, they stepped out. But Pharaoh and his men did the same exact thing, except they drowned because it wasn't mixed with faith. And that's the whole point. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. By faith, the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe <clears throat> when she had received the spies with peace. You remember the story, Joshua then picking up the baton from Moses after he kind of blew it and the Lord said, you're not going in. Joshua takes the people of God and he takes them in. And the first thing they do, they circumcise them all. So all of those years wandering around the wilderness, they weren't circumcising their children. That's a problem. But they go in and the very first target, it's the biggest, most monstrous city, it's Jericho. And the Lord says, it's all right, I've got you. I'm going to take care of you. The battle is mine. Don't sweat it. And you know what they do. They go around the walls and they worship, and they bring the Ark of the Covenant, and the Levites are there, all the things you're not supposed to do according to the law, and they do it because God said so. And then the seventh day, which is a day of rest, they do it seven times, which is what they're not supposed to do on the seventh day. And God causes all the walls to go, falls down, and they take everybody out. And God gave them victory, Amen. except for one place in the wall where there was a woman named Rahab who had faith she had faith in something that occurred way before this. These walls fell down, not by the effort of man, but because they believed God. Rahab believed, and she was, of what she heard about God's activity 40 years ago. 
you know, when the spies came in and they were having a conversation and said, hey, I, I, God is with you guys because I heard what you did to those kings. Do you know that happened 40 years previous? She believed something she heard about that happened 40 years ago, maybe even before she was born. But because she had faith, she and her household and everybody that was in that place, they were preserved and they got saved. It's the same for us, isn't it? And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me, which, yes, I totally understand that. <laughs> to tell you of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, and turned to fight the enemies of the aliens. Well, let me pull that apart. No. You get the idea? He's like, do you guys have enough examples now of faith that you understand what I'm talking about? Because I don't have enough time to tell you about all of the rest of the people in the scriptures, right? In fact, you can insert your story here. Because you guys are carrying on the same exact walk of faith that these guys started. Wouldn't you like to have a book made of your life? You should be such that you say, you know what, if it's going to bring one person to Christ, I'll do it. So, wouldn't it be good for somebody to make a book of your life? Yes. Okay. <laughs> You're leading the witness. Okay, sorry. And it, going on with the overwhelmed avalanche was women receiving their dead raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. It's like, do not resuscitate, man. I'm going home. Well, you know, if you deny Jesus Christ, I won't shoot you in the head. No, that's okay. I'm going home. Don't even count to three. <laughs> I'm going home. Unless this is your home. Then you don't want to leave. It's interesting. It says that women receive their dead raised to life again. Why would, why would women be singled out as to having received their dead again. It's interesting. All of the resurrection stories throughout the scripture, these folks are always delivered over to women. It's rather interesting. If you look at the widow of Zarephath, there was a resurrection. If you look at the Shulamite woman in 2 Kings by Elisha, there was a resurrection. If you look at the widow of Nain, Jesus raised up a boy, to, gave him to a woman, and Lazarus was given back to Mary and Martha. Women received back their dead. It's rather interesting. Women seem to be high recipients of those who have died and resurrections throughout the scripture. But maybe it's just a coincidence. So there's recitation, resuscitation, and resurrection. Uh, okay. I don't have time. I just don't have time. Bottom line is this. If you're doing what the Lord wants you to do, you don't have to worry about it even if you're going to die. Amen. If you're going to die, don't look for a shortcut. Don't, don't, don't sweat it. Don't get all freaked out. I mean, if you can, if you can get repaired, if you, if you can do that, that's great. But if not, don't sweat it. You're going to get there before me. Or maybe not. Maybe I'll get there before you. Women receive their dead. Listen, Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by him. If you know him, you're in. If you don't know him, you need to know him. Amen. You need to know Jesus Christ. Matthew 7, 13, Jesus says, Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, there are few who find it. Jesus Christ is that way. And it's exclusive. You can't believe in everybody else and Jesus. It's in Jesus alone. Still others had a trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment, and they were stoned, not the happy kind. And they were sawn in two. <laughs> they were tempted. They were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. He's talking about all of the prophets and all of those 
who believed God, and yet they lived a very difficult life. The testing of true faith does not make it die, but it purifies and magnifies. Faith is one of those things when God tests you, you will rise to, to the occasion, and God will make it good. Like exercise. Whenever you exercise a muscle, whenever you do that, like when you exercise faith, it will get you stronger. That's the way it works. God finds a new way every day to ask you, do you trust me? Every single day, you will have an opportunity that you're faced with, whether you're going to believe God or not, and whether you're going to trust him. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. But God, having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. <clears throat> Do you understand that because of all of these things that went on before us, we have great examples. These guys didn't. These guys were just doing what God told them to do. But we have all of this information. My goodness, we live in an information age. There's AI. There's, oh my goodness. You can get stuff just like that. Question is, are you looking at the stuff that's really of eternal consequence? We're to imitate those who through faith and patience have inherited the promise. Now these things happened to them as examples and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. You understand all of the scripture has been, has been made and penned for us so that we might see these examples and follow them. I hope you guys are encouraged by the book of Hebrews. Uh, we're going to go through uh, probably chapter 12 next week. If, and, and Lord willing, we'll get there. By all means, please open up the book. Open up the book and read the stories for yourself. It's encouraging. And look for those examples where these people took faith and put it into practice. They believed God for what he said, and they moved and stepped forward. Because I guarantee you that God is asking something of you today to take a step. Mm -hmm.